Hey there, Goblin Smackers. Welcome back to Dungeon Crawlers Anonymous. My name is Ron, and today we're going to be beginning our actual playthrough of Alter Quest, a one to four player cooperative adventure game from the Sadler Brothers and published by uh, Blacklist Games. We are, we've done a box tour, which if you haven't already watched that, go check that out to see kind of a component overview and specifically how I store the game and what you can imagine it will look like when you pull it off your shelf, not necessarily what it'll look like when you buy it. I've also done a setup video, which this takes place right afterwards. Um, we went through and set up the whole game for one player, for one hero. Um, it doesn't really matter how many heroes you have, the process is basically the same. And we are ready to begin the search quest, which is the recommended first quest. So we're going to be playing the search quest. Just for review, we're going to be going up against the villain Bulks, the Belch Lord here. And the threat that we're going to be facing off against is the Frox. This is the recommended first setup um, or first game kind of uh, configuration. So fighting against the Frox, Bulks as the villain, and um, any hero is recommended, or and the search quest, and then any hero you want to play is recommended. So that's great news. And hey guys, I have one quick amendment on that setup that we did in this Lurker deck. There are actually a set of cards called Rivals. You can see here the thief is a rival, the fanatic is a rival, the traitor is a rival, and the spy is a rival. So you're going to want to actually take these uh, rival cards out of your lurker deck. They are used for a specific scenario um, or quest called the hunt. And uh, you can include them, um, but there's a special way to add them to your deck, and they do tend to be added for um, for extra difficulty. So in this case, we're going to go ahead and remove these four cards from the Lurker deck, and I'm going to keep those out. Now, one thing we did forget to do during our setup is actually take care of our dice. These blue dice here are hero dice. You don't need to do anything special with them. Just, um, just gather them up and set them somewhere nearby so that players will have access to them as they play the game. These black dice here are the altar dice with the rune symbols on them. There are six unique rune symbols, and these are going to be referenced by cards in the game, and typically they allow additional effects. Some of them are really good for you, the heroes, such as giving you extra armor or uh, maybe being able to do some extra damage, but some of the effects will also be able to be used by the villain and by the minions and by altars and all kinds of other stuff that can do bad things to you, such as hurting you or removing tokens from your character, etc. So these are really important. There's my cat on the board. Um, and uh, what you need to do at the beginning of the game is go ahead and give these a roll and then set them all aside um, over, I, I tend to put them over um, just over here on kind of the side of the board where I'm going to be able to see them but where they won't, you know, necessarily get in the way. You can organize them. Whoops, that was one of these diamond looking guys here. And then they can be used throughout the game to do all kinds of different effects. So make sure you roll those dice and then set them near, nearby. All right, and just as we get started here, as a reminder, we're doing the search quest, which is going to ask us to find a matching pair of clues and then use them in the altar room. And then once we do that, we can add a token to our um, search uh, card here. And once um, all of the uh, once we've put one per player quest tokens on here, we can uh, we can. Oh well, we've actually we found the artifact, and you win the game. Um, so we're going to keep that in mind. Uh, that's the quest that we're playing, and we've decided to start here in this bottom room. I've got Marine set up on the stairs, and we're ready to begin playing. Now then, on the hero turn, you get to take three actions. You get to take any three actions you want. Here on your hero turn card is a short list of all the actions that are available to you. You can move up to three spaces. You can take a card action. You can do an interact action on something on the board. You can play an action card. You can draw a card from your deck, you can rest, you can channel. Um, so we'll go through what all of these mean um, in detail here, just so you guys understand what all these different actions do. And let's start right at the top with move. Move up to three spaces. This is pretty simple. If you take a move action, you can move orthogonally, you can move diagonally, um, and that's pretty much it. You can move up to those three spaces if you'd like. Uh, movement's always three unless it's modified in some way. And you cannot split up your movement to take other actions, but you can interrupt your movement to take an exhaust action, a use action, or to open a door. So keep those in mind if you have cards that have exhaust um, 
abilities on them that aren't tied to another action or uh, a use ability, you can do that as well as opening these doors. Interestingly enough, opening a door does not constitute an action, uh, nor does it take a movement point. You can simply open a door. And speaking of that opening a door action, we will go through that later on um, when I actually open one of these doors. So don't worry, we'll go through that whole process. The next type of action is a card action. This is an action that is on a card that you control, which means it's placed out in front of you and it has an action on it. So for example, Marine here starts with the spike shield in play and it has an action on it. The action is to discard one armor token from yourself to deal two damage to an enemy within range. The range of course is this purple number or color here. And then there is an exhaust at the bottom of this action. Anytime you have an exhaust at the bottom here, what this means is um, it's looking at the rune dice. And we rolled those rune dice earlier in the, in the video. And if any of these symbols show up, this uh, shield or diamond looking symbol here shows up, then we can actually re-roll that die in order to do this action at the bottom here. And this exhaust at the beginning means after we do that action, the card will be tapped, which means we won't be able to exhaust it again. We can still do this action here, as far as I understand, but you can't do this additional thing here where you're allowed to exhaust one of these or reroll this type of rune die to gain an additional armor token. So card action, you can take the main action. You may do the exhaust action if there is one. There may not be an exhaust action here. It may just look like this, where you've got just the die, which means you don't have to exhaust the card when you use it. You just have to roll, reroll um, a rune die that matches the symbol. The next type of action you can take on your turn is the interact action, which allows you to resolve the interact listed on any card in play. This is different than an action, and typically it's going to be on, say, those features that are going to be out on the board. You can interact with those features to, for example, get some healing, gain some armor tokens, do some searching, maybe look in the search or the, the quest deck, that kind of stuff. So interact is going to be important later on in the game. I'll show you when one of those comes out so you can see it. Next on the list is playing an action card. So this is actually playing cards from your hand. So uh, at the beginning of the game, you are gonna draw four cards into your hand, and those are your, those are, that's gonna be your opening hand of cards that you can use to interact with things on the board. And what's really cool about this game, one of the many things, is that each hero has a completely unique hero deck that you get to go through um, with different types of cards and actions. So you get to simulate all kinds of different types of heroes. Marine here is a very unique combination of like a vampire, tank essentially she's a defender um, but she's a vampire so she can do some um, she can do some uh, draining abilities and some other cool stuff now there are three kinds of, of cards in your character deck there's well plus um, there are three kinds of, of playable cards in your character deck of course there is the character card and the equipment aside from those there are action cards reaction cards and feet cards and action cards there's really two types there's actions and then there's ongoing actions Actions are pretty straightforward. You simply play the card as an action, then you do what it says. So in this case, we would take a search test here. This tells you um, the type of test, a searching test, and the type of stat. So it's orange and it has this symbol here, which means it is a, uh, I think that's endurance test. Uh, so this exploits surroundings, you would take that test, then each character in your room gains an armor token. So in addition to searching and all the things that come along with that, we'll go through the search action later, uh, each character in your room gains an armor token, which is pretty cool. And at the bottom here is an example of that rune symbol without the exhaust, which is discard one armor token from each enemy in your room. So if this symbol is out on the die, um, the altar die, which just to grab and show you here, it actually is, um, this is that symbol out on one of the die. I could re-roll this and take that new result um, to be able to perform the second ability kind of listed on this card, which is discard one armor token from each enemy in your room. That's just is a free part of your action. Now, I'm not going to do that because obviously we're not actually playing a card yet, but just to show you how that works. So that's a standard action card. Next, you have an ongoing action card. The difference is simply that ongoing cards stay out in play until something has them go away. Uh, using Shadows here is um, an action card that I can play as a Marine to play on a hero within range. They would then gain this card, the range is, is here in this purple symbol, uh, they would gain this card, they would gain control of it, and then they would have the ability to use this card to move up to three spaces and gain two armor tokens and then discard this card uh, back to Marine's discard pile. And additionally, it has an exhaust ability as well. 
So you can see here the next type of action card in your deck is a reaction. Uh, this isn't actually an action card, this is um, a different type of card that you can use. Uh, the reaction ability is exactly what you would imagine it would be if you've played any type of game like this before. It's essentially something that's going to have a trigger effect and then you're allowed to play this for free out of turn essentially. So in this case Sworn to Protect here says play this card when an enemy within range inflicts. That is does an inflict type uh, test. There are many different types of tests in the game. Uh, you may gain one armor token, move up to three spaces toward the enemy, and choose to become the new target. So um, you can essentially keep this in your hand, and uh, if something happens within range that you can react to, you can discard this card to do that thing. And then of course at the bottom here you can see there's some rune dice focus. So in addition, I could reroll this to gain one focus as part of this card effect. Finally, there are feet cards. Feet cards are awesome cards. They're always going to feel fun because they don't take an action to play. You just get to do some cool stuff and then move on with your turn. Um, in this case here, the Old Ways has a test with a difficulty of three. Again, we will go over tests later, but that's what that symbol means. This is an orange attribute test um, with difficulty three. If you pass, you deal two damage to an enemy within range, range of one, to heal two damage. And then we can uh, use this rune ability here uh, rune die to heal one extra damage with this card. So yeah, those are the different types of cards. This happens to be the hand that we have. Um, so yeah, we're going to be able to keep these in mind as we decide what actions we want to take on our turn. The next type of action we can take is to draw a card. You can simply spend an action to draw one card from your deck. You could take a rest action, which allows you to discard one supply token, which is this guy here, to heal two damage. That's going to be one of your primary ways to do uh, to do healing when you need to. And lastly, you can channel, which is gain one focus, that's this guy here, and change one altar die to a result of your choice. Really cool, this allows you like, man, I really wish I could get one of those diamonds so I could get some armor tokens or something like that. You could take this channel ability, you get a focus, which you can use to do better at tests, again we'll talk about that later, and change an altar die to the result of your choice. When taking actions, you're going to want to track them. So the way that you do that is you're going to, everybody at the table is going to have three of these action tokens. After you take an action, simply flip it over to the darkened side. Once you've done all three, you're going to take instead your turn card, which uh, is you've been using to kind of look at the different actions you take, and flip it over, symbolizing that you are done with your turn. When everybody's cards uh, has been flipped over to the side with the threat villain and quest turn information, the hero phase is essentially over, and now we need to go through the threat turn, the villain turn, and then the quest turn. All right, now this isn't just an instructional video, it's an actual gameplay video, and let's get to the gameplay. Before we begin, let's go ahead and read the flavor text here. Since their appearance, the altars have attracted more than just power-hungry schemers and vile monsters. Legendary artifacts that have remained hidden from the world for centuries are also drawn toward the magic that emanates from the altars. It is a common belief that all relics and enchanted weapons were originally empowered by the hidden altars. If you cannot leave, you cannot leave these items to be found by evil forces. So let's take a look at how we actually win this uh, scenario. So in the search, if there is one P, that means one per player, in this case only one because there's only one hero really, um, if there was one player playing two heroes, this would be 2P, even though there's only one player. If there's 1P quest tokens on this card, and each hero is on the stairs tile, the heroes have found the artifact and win the game. At any time, a hero may discard any number of clue cards they control. And we'll talk about this activate text uh, towards the um, during the quest phase when that happens. So we're trying to find quest tokens, and the way that we put those on to this is by collecting two clues and then heading over to the altar. So we have to find the altar. We know the altar is at the bottom of the feature deck because they're in the setup for the quest. We took the altar and we shuffled it among two other cards and then put the rest of the cards on top. So we have to get through at least five rooms, possibly six, maybe seven, maybe even if we're really unlucky, eight rooms to be able to find that altar. So I know we're going to be doing lots of exploring and lots of opening rooms up, which is cool because, well, that's what we're here to do, isn't it? Our very first action of the game is going to be a move action. And we're going to move right up to this door here and we're going to open it. So we're going to move one, two spaces, and then there's a couple, some interesting rules about door spaces. The only spaces that are door spaces are adjacent to these doors drawn on the board here. So this space and this space are both door spaces. These are the only two spaces that you can move to to open doors and to move in between rooms. That's really important basically because you cannot move diagonally into a room like this 
or out of a room or whatever. You have to move from this space to this space. And this space and this space are doors, which means if we move to this space right here, there is a closed, even though the mini looks open, there's a closed door there. We're gonna go ahead and open it. Now remember, opening a door is a free action that you can take any time during your turn you're standing on a door space. You can just do that whenever you want. So even though we're in the middle of our movement and our movement cannot be interrupted by normal actions, it can be interrupted by this opening a door action as well as exhaust and use actions which we might have out in front of us we don't right now. So let's go ahead and open this door. Revealing a room is a, a, a three-step process that we take care of at this point as soon as we open the door. It's uh, under the quest turn on page 16 in your rulebook. It's not part of the quest turn. It's actually part of the hero turn. But just so you know, there is a three-step process here. So we're going to be going through that real quick to show you guys how that works. The first step is to draw a feature card. So let's go ahead and take our deck of feature cards here that we've got been we built and we're going to draw the very first feature card and this is the feature that's in this room we found the blessed fountain so we're going to go ahead and grab this card we're going to get the miniature that matches this card and we're going to put them in the room so here is the uh, beautiful feature for the blessed fountain as well as the card that matches it we're going to take this feature and we're going to place it in the room now we talked a little bit about these icons here on the board where you place uh, features the way that these work is depending on the size of the feature itself. You have one uh, square features, two square features, and four square features. So here's an example of a one space, a two space, and then that fountain is a four space. So depending on the size of the feature being added, uh, the icon tells you everything you need to know about where it goes. So if it's a one, um, a size one feature, it goes in the fanciest looking white arrow here. It's got like a whole it's got like a diamond shaped body and then another arrow. That's the first space that needs to be occupied basically by the feature. So in this case, if this room had the locked chest, I would place it here. If you have a feature that takes up two spaces like the weapon rack here, you would fill up both white arrow spaces. So you can see here, there's the white arrow where we put the lock chest and then next to it is another white arrow. You can see another example here and another example here. In this case, it would simply go like this. Finally, if you have a size four uh, feature, it would go into those two spaces as well as the two gray arrow spaces next to it. Now, they might be really hard to see there. Here, hopefully, you can see that there's two gray arrows um, next to these white arrows. They're much more visible on the map itself. But anyway, we would go ahead and take this feature and just plop it right down there so that it covers up all four of those spaces. Now, this feature deck needs to go in your quest area. Now, the quest area is where we've got the quests, some other quest decks and stuff. And this area is, like I said in the setup video, this area is going to continue to grow. So you want to make sure there's lots of room for cards here. For example, in this scenario, there's eight rooms we have to explore, which means there's going to be eight feature cards out in this questing area. So I'm going to go ahead and just move a couple of these things. We'll put this token up here so we know when we've got it. And we'll just place our first feature right here. So here is our blessed fountain. Step two of revealing a room is drawing a quest card. You're always going to draw a quest card for the feature that you're, uh, that you're revealing and adding to the room. In that case, we'll go ahead and take one of these, the search quest cards, and we'll flip it over and we'll see what we've discovered in this room with the Blessed Fountain. Prepared defenders. Even before pushing the door open, you hear sounds of preparation and battle shouts. The rattle of weapons or armor soon follow. The advantage is lost. However, there's nothing to do but continue on. The search is far from over. So when revealed, we attach this card to the room's feature card. Each enemy drawn when revealing this room gains two armor tokens. Oof, that's not good. Then it has an activate ability. Um, again, these activate abilities we'll talk about during the quest phase, but basically what this says is that a hero adjacent to the attached feature may draw a card from the clue deck when this card is activated. This is the primary way that you're gonna gain those clues. If a hero takes control of a clue card, this gets discarded, which basically means each feature can be explored once for a clue as you move through the dungeon, finding clues, revealing features, etc. So let's go ahead and take this prepared defenders card and we're going to attach it to the fountain. And then what we're going to do that is we're just going to place them so that you can see all the rules. And then once we finish this setup here, we'll move this down so that basically all we have now is a fountain that has two activate abilities. A hero adjacent to this feature may re-roll, may roll an alter die and 
look for clues. Both of those will happen later on in the quest phase. The last step of revealing a room is to draw threats. Now, even though only one hero explored this room, we draw a threat card for every hero in the game. Um, and uh, yeah, that's gonna spawn monsters, it might create events, it might spawn a trap, all kinds of fun stuff could come from this threat deck. So let's take a look. So because we're only playing one hero, we're only gonna draw one threat card, but don't worry, that should be plenty for us. Let's see what the frocks have in store for us. A Frox Raider. Okay, so this is our first enemy. It's a minion. It's got one armor, six health. It has a movement speed of five, and it's got a range of one. And then it shows how it actually works in combat. Now, I drew this card. So this card is now, basically, it is um, something that I control. I now control this Frox Raider. Now, when I gain control of that threat, one important thing to keep in mind is that he was prepared. He had readied his defenses based on the, uh, the quest card that we drew. So he gets two armor tokens, which are basically the way that combat works. Um, you're going to do damage, and then you're going to reduce it by his armor value, and then you're going to reduce it by armor tokens by removing one token per damage prevented. And then finally, the damage will be applied to their health pool. You'll see that again. Don't worry if that was too fast. You'll see it again when we get into combat. But basically, he's coming out extra armored. So when we spawn figures, we want to uh, pull the enemy card and attach it. The next thing you're going to want to do is go ahead and find uh, the miniature that matches that. And um, you might have the rings pre-set up. I don't have the rings just because I'm playing a solo game and I don't feel like I, I, I need them. Um, although I suppose if I get another minion out, I will have to uh, put a ring on it so that I can track it. Um, and I do like it, so I will put a ring on it if I need to. Um, but for right now, we're just going to leave it off. So let's go ahead and take this guy and we're going to place him out in the world. Now, enemies spawn in what's called a shadow space. There's a shadow space in every room of the map, and it's basically a room with a big crack in the bottom where monsters could climb out. Here's an example of a shadow space. Uh, let's see. This one right here, particularly hard to see, but that's a shadow space. There's a shadow space here, and in the room that we've just explored, the shadow space is right here in the corner. So he appears right there. The only other thing to keep in mind with threats is if um, you, uh, you can't draw a threat card because there aren't any cards left, then you actually have to draw a lurker card instead, and that's generally not a, a good thing. You really don't want to draw lurker cards. Um, and then the last thing is that you can only reveal one room per hero activation. So if, for example, Marine happened to get far enough that she could open another door in this new room, we would still only be able to do that on our next turn because we've already revealed one room for our turn. Now, we've finished revealing the room. There's a couple more things left to do. One, I take these doors and I will go ahead and just place new doors wherever there's a new unrevealed room beyond. Um, essentially, this is my way of tracking which rooms have been revealed and which ones haven't. Plus, it looks awesome. Here's all these cool doors for us to interact with. We've got a Frox over here. We're one action into the game. We're not even done with our action, actually. And we've already got all kinds of action <laughs> to, for us to deal with. Now the important thing to remember is opening that door was a free action that did interrupt our movement, so we have one space of movement left. Let's go ahead and do the only legal move into this room that we can, which is directly across into the next space. So next we have a few things we want to do. Uh, because of the way the search um, quest works, we're going to want to be next to this fountain at the end of our turn so that we can search it during the quest phase and start collecting clues. Um, so I'm going to make sure that I end here. And I, I want to make sure that I end up next to this uh, this space, but I also want to deal with this minion. I want to at least do a little damage to him. And I want to start setting up to getting into another room because hopefully we'll get a clue and we'll be able to move into another room next turn to keep that momentum moving forward. Because stuff's going to keep spawning and things are going to get hairier and hairier for Marine here. I want to get close to that door and I also want to end my turn next to this feature and I'd also like to do a little damage to this guy. So I've been thinking about what I want to do and I think I know what that result is going to be. So. First, we're going to go ahead and do another move action. We're going to uh, use one of our, our second action for the turn to do another move. We're going to move three spaces. One, two, three. That puts us next to this thing, next, close to this door, and it keeps us within range of this guy for a thing that I want to show you next, which is the ability on our character's card. Beckoning Stance, which says here that we need to exhaust one of these kind of gem-looking runes. Uh, Choose an enemy within range. Move that enemy up to three spaces towards you. The range is four, and we can move them three spaces. So let's go ahead and pick one of these runes right here that matches that. We'll roll it up. I got a fire. 
So we're gonna go ahead and place that back down. And now we're gonna go ahead and use this ability. Now the range is four spaces. This guy here is one, two, three spaces away, and we can move him up to three spaces towards us. One, two. Now what's really cool about this is it's not an action. This is just an exhaust ability. So we exhausted the die, we or we rerolled the die, we tap this card because it is an exhaust ability, and then we get to do that, and we still have one of our actions left. Our last action of the turn is gonna to be to go ahead and use Marine's Blade here. We're gonna use the action on this card. This is, to, this is a card action. We'll go ahead and expend our last action to do this. And we're gonna do this action right here, an attack test. So let's talk about how tests work. Like any good action in a board game, a, doing a test has a list of steps you need to go through. Now, eight steps obviously seems like a lot. There's some timing here that matters. Don't worry, this is pretty straightforward. So the first step we're gonna do here is gather dice. Now, on this page in the rule book, I recommend that you, uh, you take a look at these, page 18 and 19 in the rule book here, if you've got the game, has all of the test types listed out that you're gonna encounter, whether it's a test, an attack, an inflict, a resist, a search, or a task. These are basically all the types of tests you're gonna do in the game, with tests being the most generic. And um, there, it, it's good because each of these has some special rules that you need to keep in mind. So in this case, we're gonna be doing an attack test and going through this procedure. I'll, uh, I'll keep everything in line for you so we don't have to worry too much, but just so you know, that's kind of what we're looking at. So step one of the test procedure is to gather dice. So let's take a look at our, we'll put this right here. Let's take a look at our sword here. The sword has the red attribute, which is strength. So we're gonna go ahead and look at our character card here and our strength is two, which means for this test, we're gonna go ahead and grab two hero dice. We'll put those right next to that for now. Next step is to modify dice. Uh, if there are any dice that, if there are any modifications to your dice pool, this is when you would do it now. For example, discarding um, supply for extra dice, uh, etc. Now we don't have any supply. We don't really start with anything, um, so uh, we're just going to have to go with those two dice and hope for the best. The next step in the process here is to roll our dice. So I've got our two hero dice right here. Let's give them a roll and see what we get. We got two successes. Next, we would resolve any critical results. We don't have any, but I will explain how these work. If you get a critical result, which is this cool circular uh, result here, you get to keep that die, you grab a new die, and you roll it. If that is also a critical result, you get to keep that and roll another die. Um, that is the focus result, which we'll talk about next, but that's how critical, critical results work. They count as a result, as a success, in addition let you letting you roll another dice. So that's the critical results. Next step would be to use focus. You may spend one or more focus tokens to convert an equal number of focus results into successes. This is the focus result right here. You can turn this into a success by spending the corresponding focus token. Next, you cancel successes. Um, based on the type of test. So, in the case of an attack, well, you cancel successes for the armor and then for the armor tokens. So right here, we've got two successes with our attack roll. First, we look at the armor of the target. This target has one armor, so we remove one success from our results. Next, we remove results for every armor token one to one. So this guy has two armor tokens on him, so we're gonna go ahead and discard one armor token and one success. And that's it. If, for example, we had another success, we would lose one more armor token, and if somehow we had yet another one, that's when we'd actually add one damage token to this guy, signifying that we've actually managed to hurt him. Unfortunately, in this case, thanks to his preparedness, all of our damage has been absorbed uh, by, his, by his armor. The next step here would be to apply results. Then you remove any remaining successes based on the type of test. That would be when we actually deal the damage. And finally, gain focus. At the end of that, you get to take one focus token for every focus result remaining. So if, for example, I had rolled this, and I did not have any focus tokens, I would have two successes, one focus, which is basically not a success. And at the end, I could, um, I could gain one focus token for every focus result out on these die uh, on these dice. So if I had four focus, I could get four tokens, which basically gives me four successes in the future. If 
Finally, there is one side of the die that is both a, uh, a success and a focus. So basically this is one success. It could be two if you already have a focus token or it might give you a focus token at the end if you don't have the focus token to convert it. All in all, I just wanna say this is a really uh, positive testing system. I feel like you're always kind of succeeding or very close. There's no basically failure here. I realize that the focus means you kind of don't succeed, but it's really the limit of the dice themselves that's going to limit you, not rolling a bunch of dice and ending up with a failure. Certainly it will happen, um, but uh, yeah, I, I think this is a really positive dice mechanic for just enjoying. It's kind of a fail forward system, because even if you do fail, you're going to get these tokens, which can make your next attempt even that much better. So all in all, we didn't really do too much damage here with Marine's Blade when we attacked. That said, this does have an exhaust effect and we do have that type of rune dice out. So we're gonna go ahead and do this as well. Anytime you have an, a card like this that has an effect at the bottom here, you have to have done the action on the card in order to be able to get the effect of this exhaust. For example, I couldn't just, well, I wanna exhaust a thing to do one damage to an enemy within range. Our range is one. The exhaust is this type of die. So we'll go ahead and re-roll that flame die that we got earlier. We got a spiral. And then this says, deal one damage to an enemy within range. One thing that's really important to keep in mind here is that this is dealing one damage directly to an enemy. So in this case, because there wasn't a test, that damage just goes straight on the monster. Even though he's armored and everything like that, I can basically use this as exhaust effect to just do a direct damage. Armor and uh, armor tokens, defense and armor tokens here are only taken into account for yourself as well as for minions and, and, and such if it is an inflict or an attack test. That's it. Any other time you're dealing damage or applying damage, it just goes straight on, it, whether that target is the minion or the target is you. So something really important to keep in mind. So at this point, we've taken three actions for our turn, and the last thing we need to do is take our hero turn card and flip it over to the other side. Now, if there were other players in the game, they'd be able to take their turns, uh, do their hero actions, play cards, do all the stuff they need to do, maybe explore some rooms, continue searching, but because um, we're playing a solo round, we're basically done for the turn, and now the next thing we need to do is go through these other turns. The threat turn, the villain turn, and the quest turn. And they tell you right here on this card basically everything you need to know, at least about what the, the uh, what you need to do on those turns. So let's start with the threat turn. In any order the players choose, each hero resolves the activate text on each card in the threat area from left to right. So in this case, I've basically built a threat area above my, my what, these are my um, equipment cards, this is my hero card, I suppose I would need a spot for a discard pile, I'd probably put that over here. So my threat area is right here, and I've only got one card in my threat area at this point, which is the Frox Raider. So the Frox Raider, the way that we uh, activate him is we just look at his text down here and we see what he does. So this activate moniker is it's kind of interesting. One thing that I think you just want to get in mind right away is that these activate texts are only for these out of turn actions, as far as I've found anyway. Anything that says activates either going to happen during the threat turn, the villain turn, or the quest turn, not during your turn out on the board. So you're not going to be activating things during your turn. They're going to be activated by these other turns. I think once you figure that out, the rest of this pretty much falls into place. So in this case, in the threat turn, we would go from left to right, looking at all of the threats out on our board and activating each of them. So in the case of the Frox Raider here, his activate says, activate, engage. Engage essentially works in that the monster is going to try to get into the optimal position to target and inflict damage on the nearest character. So the AI in this game is fairly straightforward. It's basically going to try to get into position to do the most damage or to attack the most, um, the, the closest character. The optimal position is the space farthest from the target and within range as listed on the enemy's card. So in the case of the Frox Raider here, he's got a melee weapon, so his maximum range is one space away. But if, for example, we were dealing with the Bogmancer here, his activate is actually an inflict targeting every character within range, and here's his range. So he's not engaging anybody, he's just trying to do everything he can. Obviously everyone's going to be different, and some of them might actually have a different order. For example, it might activate and then engage. So in the case of the Raider here, who has a movement of five and a range of one, and if you look at where we're at, we're already engaged with him, so he doesn't need to move around. So he's gonna stay right where he is, and his engage is complete. So looking back at the Frox card here, the next thing after engage, which ends with a period, is inflict. 
This is just like uh, your other tests that we've seen so far. So this is a red uh, strength test. It's an inflict test, which means he's trying to inflict damage on you, and the, and the strength is five. If he's unable to do that inflict test, then he would engage and gain an armor token. So essentially, he's going to attack somebody that's at his range for five damage. But if he can't, because maybe he engaged but didn't have enough movement to get close to somebody, he would instead engage again and gain an armor token. So the next thing he's going to do is inflict us. So just like our last test, we're going to go ahead and take a look at the attribute that matches here. The strength is two, which means we're going to be rolling two dice to defend against this attack. Now, it's a difficulty of five, which means we're probably going to end up taking some damage here. All right, so we got a success, and then we got a success and a focus. We still don't have any focus tokens yet, so we've got two successes and one uh, partial success. With an inflict test, you're attempting to prevent damage. So in this case, we're taking five damage and we're rolling a test to see how much more damage or how much fewer damage we can take. So in this case, we got two successes, which means we reduce that by three or by two. So now the incoming damage is three. Then we can look at our defense here and we have one defense. So therefore, now the incoming damage is two. If we had armor tokens, we'd be able to, if we wanted, spend one armor per damage to prevent even more damage. One armor token per damage prevented. That's a may, so you can save it for later if you want to. Since we don't have any armor tokens yet, we're going to be taking two points of damage. So we'll go ahead and grab two damage points, and then I start a token pool kind of under my character. There are lots of different tokens you might be collecting. Damage, supply, armor, uh, focus, threat. So I kind of start a token pool underneath my character line here just to keep track. Put them where it makes sense for you. So in this case here, we've taken two damage of our 14 health, so we're still feeling okay. Lastly, we did get a focus result here, so we're going to go ahead and gain a focus token as well because we weren't able to, uh, to turn that, to convert that, we get a focus instead. Now then the last thing to look at on here is this uh, is his rune action or rune effect, which is if we have the blood droplet here, he can engage again and do another inflict. And unlike rune dice that are on your cards, you have to do these. Basically, these monsters are always going to consume these things to do something bad to you. So in this case, he's going to go ahead and spend this uh, rune die here by re-rolling it. Okay, that's good for us at least. We got another one of those uh, gem looking ones. Um, that changed our success, not that it matters anymore. And then uh, he's going to go ahead and inflict again. And this time it's against uh, the fortitude stat, which is I'm a little better at. I have three dice, and it's only a strength or a difficulty four. So we're going to go ahead and do the exact same thing. This time we're going to roll three dice, though, and let's hope we do a little bit better. All right, well, we did basically the same. We got two successes and one focus, partial success. We could spend this to make this three successes to reduce the damage. Uh, I think I'm going to keep my focus just in case. I'm not really sure if I want to spend it just yet. So we're going to be taking two damage because we've got two successes, and this is a strength four minus one for our, uh, our defense here. So we're going to be taking one more point of damage. So now we're at three. There are other types of threat cards that you might have to deal with during this phase. For example, these trap cards come out and they place themselves out on the board close to the features. If you're in the room with them, or, or if this is in your uh, play area, this activate text comes up, which says that everybody in the room has to gain a threat token and must do a resist to see if basically if they can avoid the trap as they're moving around. If there's nobody in the room, instead you draw a threat card replacing this one. Uh, and of course that threat wouldn't activate this turn, but next turn you'd have yet another, probably another angry frog or maybe more, um, maybe more angry uh, muck stakes coming at you. The trap has some other text in here that we'll get to later, um, maybe in a, in a future turn. It's pretty straightforward. It tells you how this trap would get triggered if it's in your threat area, which is if somebody moves within one space of it on the board. And then an interact here, which allows you to actually reduce, um, to add progress tokens to it based on your result. And if you ever uh, finish it, put enough progress on here to remove the trap, then it actually gets removed from your threat area, removed from the board, and you gain a supply as a reward. So just something to keep in mind if you end up with one of these traps in your threat area. Uh, this one is an event that actually ends up sitting out in your threat area. You can see here you can uh, interact with it, um, which is on your turn. You can spend an action to do that and discard a focus. And, but during, the, act, during uh, the threat phase, you actually have to activate it in order to deal with this effect. So here there is a, I think that's dexterity. 
um, check, and if you fail, you gain a threat token. Then for each threat token you have, either discard one focus or suffer one damage, and it makes you take more damage. So there's all kinds of threats that are going to be out there, whether you're being swarmed by froglings, you're stepping on some traps, or you're dealing with some really nasty melee dudes. The threat phase is when all the monsters and other nasty stuff on the board takes their opportunity to slap you. Once you've done all of your threat uh, cards in your area, and every other player has done that, the threat turn is over, and it goes to the villain turn. On the villain turn, we're going to look at the villain area, and we're going to resolve the activate text on every card in the villain play area from left to right. Then we're going to draw and resolve one villain card. If the villain has been instead defeated, every hero instead draws a threat card. So once the villain is actually defeated, it's just going to escalate more monsters showing up. Now, Bulks the Belch Lord doesn't have too much that he does when he's not actually out and about. So this card here, which is the scheme side of his villain card, which is what starts face up, says activate. Each hero must either discard one focus or discard one supply. And then with a blood drop, each hero must either discard one supply or suffer one damage. Well, now I'm wishing I had actually used that focus to reduce the damage. Had I looked at this, I probably would have made that choice to do that instead. But, eh, okay, sera, sera, now we're gonna, now we're just going to discard it and we've taken one extra damage. So activate, we're going to go ahead, because we don't have any supply, we will discard a focus token. Then there is another... Uh, matching rune die or altar die here in the, in the altar pool so we're gonna go ahead and use this action as well which is each hero must discard one supply or suffer one damage and we got some wind we have no supply so we're gonna go ahead and take a damage now there are no other cards other than this card in the villain area right now so the next step in is we're done with activating and now we're gonna draw a villain card and see what happens next all right, well, we've drawn Concealing Flatulence. Fantastic. Each minion gains two armor tokens. Each hero with no minion in their threat area must draw one Lurker card. Well, luckily this Concealing Flatulence is only going to give our minion more armor. It's not going to spawn a Lurker, which I really don't want to deal with. Still, two extra armor is... It's not great. This guy's only gotten one damage so far. We've got a lot of work to do on him. That is an event, which means it's a one-time action. It just happens and goes away. If it was ongoing, it would be placed in the villain area and would happen um, over the course of future villain turns. Now that we've done that, we're done with the villain phase. The last phase of the turn is the quest turn. So we're going to resolve the activate text on every card in the quest play area from left to right, then flip this card. This is basically saying from first in to, la um, to last in, we're going to activate all of the cards in our quest area. So let's head over there and take a look at what we need to activate. I've rearranged the quest area just a little bit to make it a little more left to right. I would recommend you maybe want to do the same. So I've got basically this needs to happen first, then any features need to activate, and then I think this is going to be last. It's a little unclear to me what the actual order should be. Left to right is not particularly clear, especially when it just says, you know, add it to this area, and the area has a couple decks and stuff like that. More than anything, just make sure you get this set up in such a way that you know where, um, where the different cards are and what order they need to be activated in. So in this case, I've got some space for a discard pile here if I need it, and then we're going to go ahead and be able to go straight to the Blessed Fountain after we activate the search. The search is the first thing to activate here, which says each hero who controls a clue card, a clue card, <laughs> must either discard one focus for each clue card they control or do a knowledge resistance three. Um, if there is one quest token per uh, player on this card, then everybody has to draw a threat card. So basically, once we've completed the quest, which is signified by this being on here, things start to get more serious. That said, nobody controls any clue cards yet, so we can completely ignore this. Now, the Blessed Fountain has two sets of activate text on it. The top one says a hero adjacent to this feature may re-roll or may roll one altar die. So this does happen during the quest phase. Activate, and I can re-roll. It also has an interact, which I can use during my turn as an action. I can do a uh, search test here for each supply gain during this test. You may roll one altar die. This feature the the blessed fountain lets us really mess with these altar die and our dice in lots of different ways that said we're going to go ahead and just roll one altar die i am going to pick one of these ones and i'm really going to hope that we get a gem or a fire cool we can use that 
Next, it says activate. A hero adjacent to the attached feature may draw a card from the clue deck. Then if a hero takes control of the clue card, discard this card. So we're going to go ahead and draw our very first clue card, which I think is this deck. Yep. And we got half a scroll. So once you guys see this, hopefully the rest of the, the adventure will make sense if it hasn't really made sense at this point. So when revealed, we may take control of this. While adjacent to the altar, you may discard this card along with a matching copy of Half Scroll to place one quest token on the quest rules card. So, makes sense now? Once I get two of these and I find the altar, I can go there and discard... Oh no, I can... Yeah, I can discard this and the other one. Um, the other copy to move this onto here, which signifies I found the artifact and I need to haul ass back to the stairs in order to win. So we're going to go ahead and take control of this. This is going to go into our um, play area. And then this says, if a hero takes control of a clue card, discard this card. So this card is no longer in effect, basically saying we can no longer search this blessed fountain for more clues because we found one there. So now we need to go open a new room, find a new feature, and do more searching later. And that's basically all the things that we need to do in the quest phase. Well guys, that's it for our first turn of Alter Quest. We didn't do too much yet, but we've already had quite a lot of activity. We've opened a door, we found a cool fountain, we're fighting the frocks, we've managed to find our first clue already. Hopefully we'll find the other half of the scroll pretty quick, and then we can just start searching for that altar. And let's see, we've taken a little bit of damage that we'll need to deal with soon. Um, we've done a little bit of work on this Frox Raider. Overall, pretty solid turn, and I'm looking forward to next turn when we can find some more features and have some more fun. I'm going to go ahead and call it a video here. I feel like we went into depth on a lot of rules and stuff, and I don't want to make this too overly long. I will be doing a gameplay video for turn two and three, and if you guys are liking it, maybe we can figure out how to go through the whole game. Um, if this is interesting enough, without having to explain all the rules, I think the turns will be fairly quick, so we should be able to get through most of a game, if that's something you guys are interested in. Hopefully you guys are liking the series. Um, if you have any questions about Alter Quest, or if you have any thoughts or concerns, or hey, if you just want to ask a question about it, please ask me in the comments. I'd love to chat with you about it. If you notice any rules goofs that you'd like me to point out, I'd be I'm more than happy to learn about those and make changes or fixes in the future. Um, I am still kind of figuring out how to make sure this game flows very well for me, so hopefully it's flowing okay for you guys. That said, thanks so much for stopping by, y'all. I really appreciate it. If you like the channel um, you know, and you're not a subscriber, please do hit that subscribe button so you can get notified when new videos go live. I'm going to do my best to do a video a week or so. I'm not prolific at making these things, but I do enjoy it. Um, and yeah, give the video a like if you enjoyed it, and hopefully I'll get to talk to you soon. Uh, in any case, until we talk next time, stay safe in the dungeon, my friends.